Okay, welcome to the Kennedy Class 2. I want to go over the worksheet from our workbooks. There's eight drawings without any scripts. And this is just to reinforce the uh, uh, rules of design, uh, regardless if they can be achieved or not uh, clinically. Uh, this is just to practice our illustrations. And we're going to go through our four steps as usual. And the first step would be to outline the edentulous area. The class two is the unilateral free end. And then how we're going to adhere these prosthetic teeth to the maxillary major connector would be with the mesh lattice retention here with the internal and external finishing line, etc. Identify the terminal abutments or the direct retainers, step two. And the tooth adjacent to the edentulous area is usually, if not always, the abutment tooth or primary abutment tooth. And this would be the canine. And the canine one three here, we're going to clasp with a stress breaking clasp of RP, I, Y, or G. Whether that stainless steel wire again is in Tyconium, wrought wire, platinum gold palladium, um, any of those would, would seem to be uh, accessible, uh, would be acceptable for the tooth one three. Um, so being in the aesthetic zone, we'd have to obviously measure the height of contour and the undercut of the tissue um, in the buccal labial sulcus of the one three area. Uh, but for argument's sake, we can put a roach clasp. Any of the three would be acceptable with a reciprocation to the roach clasp of a minimum of a singulum rest whether it's plated or not. Now here we have the opposing side with no modification. It's completely dentate side. We have no idea what the opposing is. And we'd always, uh, you know, classically see in the laboratory a embrasure clasp on five and six, and maybe some sort of a palatal strap connecting these two points. But now we have a rotation line, uh, and that means we would need an indirect retainer up here at the canine. If we look at our rules of design, if possible, if we could clasp one tooth anterior as possible in the posterior region when there's no modification, one is posterior as possible, that would be tooth number two, four, and two, seven. And then I'm gonna clasp with the simplest clasp form of my acres clasp. Uh, and then the last, or excuse me, the third step would be auxiliary rest or indirect retainer. Now the fulcrum line is drawn through one, three, and two, seven. And intersected medially to that would be the clasp at number two, four. So we have indirect retention. We don't need any auxiliary rests. And we can go and now complete the task of finishing off the major connector. For free ends of class one and two, it would be prudent to go as far posterior as possible. And here we'll probably exercise our anterior it could be the palatal strap, a big one, or it could be an anterior posterior palatal strap. Either would work. Obviously, less metal would be better. Now, if you wanted more indirect retention, I guess you could Kennedy bar the whole anterior. You wanted more, you could plate up here. If you wanted more indirect retention, or just maybe apron the canine and minor connector there. So this is a basic minimum. And then obviously to increase indirect retention or more support and maybe more palatal open or open the palate up a bit more, we can move to the anterior. Now, remember we talked about in the last one, all things are indicative of centric occlusion, how much bite we have, how much room we have, that's vertical dimension of occlusion, or I should say CO or CR. We don't know if the opposing is a, uh, a complete edentulous. Um, as well as uh, patient expectations. What's the previous appliance? Is this the first time they're going to be uh, wearing a prosthetic or not? And if it's a second time or third time, what is the previous appliance, right? And if we are allowed to do restorative clinical alterations, Right? Meaning, do we have room interocclusively for these rest preparations and minor connectors and canine for the bite? Especially if this is, you know, if it's a PBM and this is a full gold crown, then we've got issues here prepping into these teeth. Or we've got heavy restorative, then your prognosis becomes more guarded.
But still, this is a removable bridge. Yes, a removable parcel, but theoretically a removable bridge for 2141516171. Let's move on to the lower and kind of replicate what we've done here just for the upper. Outline the edge of this area, step one. Adhering with this mesh lattice retention. Direct retainer on the free end, stress breaking clasp on the mesial is the classic position. Now, RPG, RPY, RPI. Opposing, this is direct retainer. Now, on the opposite side, there is no modification, and we'll do the same as we did in the upper. One is anterior as possible, one is posterior as possible. And by doing that, you're moving the fulcrum line further back through the distal rests of 3.7 and 4.5. Now this becomes my indirect retainer. So that's step three, no need for auxiliary clasps. And then we can go and continue with the lingual bar. As such. And we can color it in if we want. We don't have to. Now, if they want need to, if you want to have a minor connector to support the musicals arrest, that's fine. If you wanted to add uh, more indirect retention up at the front in the form of rests, aprons, Kennedy bars, you go right ahead. I think I would probably reserve this if this becomes an embrasure clasp here, and then negating the clasp of three, four, and three, seven. Why can't we prep back here? We'd have no idea if maybe there's a lingual inclination, lingual inclination of the seven, meaning we don't have room for the bar to draw over the height of contour of the lingual of this. So maybe there's preparation problems to get that far back. Maybe we've got heavy restorative endo, crown and bridge work back here. We don't know what the opposing is. All these factors over here we put to the right are always in mind. The bite, vertical dimension of occlusion, the shade, aesthetics, previous appliance, the restorative procedures capabilities. All these things are, are, are changing the design, therefore changing the prognosis um, of the uh, of the appliance. So we'll move on to here with the Kennedy class two modification one. We're gonna outline the edentulous areas. Step one, always. Now, whether this is a mesh in post, whether it's a metal denture base, whether it's even metal, occlusion, we still need to know how we're going to attach prosthetic 1.5 to the major connector. Now, step two, direct retainers, where are they? The tooth adjacent to the edentulous area, always. Free end, if we can, always mesiocusal rest as not to tip this into the edentulous space. With one of our three stress-breaking clasps, whether we deem them to be stress breaking or not, they are categorized as such. On this side, adjacent to the dentulous area with the simplest clasp form as possible. Now again, this is bare minimum design that satisfies all the rules of design. Now this kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, auxiliary rests, possibly up here on number three, but we'll talk about that after I outline my uh, palatal strap. Okay, something like this. Again, if you're having a hard time with symmetry, you can always kind of bisect the drawing down the middle and then try to make the left side equal to the right side in arch form, as I have not. But my point on this one is now we've got something to talk about like partial denture statics. I can get a pencil here. The static design would be the three rest points, pretty much a scaling triangle of these three rest points. This uh, stability of this partial with the load of this length of free end would probably be compromised slightly to be lifting, putting a lot of pressure on the terminal abutments. So possibly maybe more prudent to add auxiliary rest up here 
on at least K9. And then now you can see the coverage of the major connector. Okay, well then we'll match it from this side. And now you can see the palatal coverage is a lot more. And if we go to the four rest or draw a line through all the rest positions, now we've gained a more surface area and more palatal coverage for some static design or support. But regardless, this would be more than acceptable just having the two acres clasps on four and six, the one G clasp on two, four, uh, and negating the apron rests. Or for that matter, you could do the whole plate, and then you can start coming back here and doing closed oval anterior posterior pedal strap as well. A lot of confusion there, possibly. I apologize for drawing over it, but let's go back to the bare minimum of acres on these two and a G clasp there with the palatal strap. That would satisfy the rules of the design. Whether it satisfies the patient, we're not sure. We're not sure if any of these are going to satisfy the patient, but this is practicing your illustrations. So therefore, if you're going to the CAD CAM room, then you have an idea of design. Or before you put the model on the surveyor, you have an idea of design. What that what you have in mind to survey. I mean, we're not going to start surveying the lateral and central here. When I look at this right away, I'm looking at the canine and I'm looking at all four posterior teeth. How am I going to adhere these four, five, six, seven of the third quadrant with my external finishing line straight down here, my direct retainer on the canine, maybe in the aesthetic window, I'll put a roach clasp and I have room for one. And now I survey four, five, six, seven. And then I realize that, you know what? I can put one anterior as possible, posterior as possible. The one anterior acting as my indirect retention of my class two. And then my step four would be connecting the major connector. Connecting my major connector lingual bar would be my first choice. If there's no room from the floor of the mouth and our hyoid group of muscles or our strong lingual frenum, then we can move to an apron in the anterior. If we want more indirect retention, Kennedy bar. We want more indirect retention, plating of the anteriors. But again, this would be reserved if I was to put my embrasure clasp on five and six, uh, hence post the surveying of four, five, six, seven, also, um, looking a little bit more deeply at the um, uh, clinical condition of these four abutment teeth, do I have restorative? Do I have, uh, do I have crown and bridge? Do I have endo treatment on any of these four? Do I have room interocclusally? Sometimes we may forego the prep if we have room interocclusally with the opposing dentition, not to kind of destroy any kind of uh, natural tooth structure. Try to preserve as best we can. Again, the rotation line will be somewhere around here. And then this is acting as my indirect retainer. The rest. The rest is preventing the lift of the free end here. And the mesial buckle undercut of the four is engaging and rotating into the undercut under the load of the posterior section. If we reduce the length of this free end, we reduce the load on this free end, meaning the occlusal length, not the acrylic length, we should always try to maintain full acrylic coverage of the free end, like a full denture, retromolar pad, internal oblique ridge, attached, detached mucosa here. But if we can kind of just restore occlusion to the six, this kind of reduces the lever of occlusion under function, under load, and under lift here. But this is also going to be imperative to really look at the opposing dentition is what's the extent of the opposing dentition. Is it a full denture? Is it natural dentition? Is it natural dentition compromised with uh, restorative fixed uh, bridge work? Let's move on to the last four. Lots to digest here. My first step is I'm going to outline the densitless area of six and seven in the second quadrant and outline the densitless area in the first quadrant of five and six. How am I going to adhere these prosthetic teeth to the major connector is with an acrylic denture base and a mesh lattice uh, uh, structure with a tissue stop here. So this would be step one. And if you notice going through all the drawings, I've created four steps. You won't find that in any textbook. 
You won't find that anywhere except listening to this fabulous YouTube production. Uh, and I think I've come up with it uh, because someone asked me once, well, what do you think about? Well, I really never really thought about it just organically. A, you know, I need all these things. But if we do it systematically, it does make sense. Outline the indigenous areas. I need to treat the terminal abutments were adjacent to the indigenous area on the free end with a stress breaking clasp. Here's a G clasp. On the opposing modification, the abutment teeth are adjacent to the edentulous area. If these abutment teeth adjacent to the edentulous, edentulous area are compromised, then it's time to stop the work, think about transitional acrylic partials, think about extractions, think about implant treatment, think about something else other than this partial. The worst thing is to go ahead and fabricate this, and then all of a sudden now we lose an abutment tooth two months post-insertion, you know, or two weeks. Uh, that's a waste of efforts. So these abutment teeth obviously are assessed, and the risk is assessed clinically from the doctor. And then that risk assessment is passed on to us in our design. But if the DDS is asking us for a preliminary design, this is what I'm going to come up with. Step one, reminder, edentulous area. Step two, direct retainers. Assuming that there is undercut at the distal buckle of 1.7, mesial buckle of 1.4. If there isn't, I mean, I have the virtual surveyor here. But if there isn't, then maybe we have to incorporate ring clasps. Maybe we have to create some undercuts. But at this, let's say, uh, designing 101, let's just assume that we have the uh, appropriate undercuts in the classic positions. Step three, auxiliary rests or additional rests for indirect retention. You can see that the fulcrum line bisected medially and at 90 degrees, we would need something at the canine. We have something on the bicuspid here, one four. I think we can get away with that. If we can't, then we can add later. Again, keep symmetrical. No straight lines in the design. If we're having a hard time keeping symmetry, as I am today with my broken pencil, maybe we can... Oh, that seems to be okay. Now again... We don't know the depth of the palate or the strength of the medium palatal rufi, the rugais here where they are. This is just a rough, let's say, guesstimation of the palatal coverage. I mean, we'd need a model to really justify this design. So this palatal strap is probably, you know, one of the weakest designs for a free end, but we're, our free end is very small being just one or two molars here. Um, if we wanted to get creative and maybe get a little bit more anterior here, we could. But I said, this all depends on the size and depth of the palate. Uh, this width here down the median line is, you know, how wide is this? I think as a rule of thumb, the posterior occlusion being replaced is the same width of the medium of the partial denture. So I drew two kind of oblong eggs here. And if I would measure them, you know, seven millimeters, seven millimeters. So the width of the major connector is somewhat loosely uh, related to the width of the posterior occlusion being replaced. Now, let's move on here to our Kennedy class two modification two. We notice here, we've got a new rule now uh, to talk about. We have an intermediate abutment or freestanding bicuspid within the, free, uh, within the uh, dentate side but it's lost its antagonistic tooth 4-4 uh, and 4-6. If this was to stay in the free end, we would negate it in the design and forego even going anywhere near it. If it's, if it's inside the carriage here, meaning it's got support from behind and in front, possibly you could add something to it. Uh, there is a phenomenon though, is once you start adding something in between two other rests, that you create a pivot point or a possible rotation line here. So I think uh, you would have to experiment a little bit. If you were to put uh, rests on it, you could always cut the rests off if a rotation exists, which probably will because this is a free end. And if it's gonna move slightly, it's gonna pivot on this rest in here. So let's just negate this in our design at all with two guide planes. Let's try to maintain this tooth as long as we can. Step one, outline the edentulous area. How we're going to adhere 
these teeth to the major connector is with an acrylic denture base mesh lattice retention step one is done step two let's talk about stress breaking clasps the teeth adjacent to the densless area at least should have a rest now if i forgo this intermediate abutment i'm back at the seven here Now this seems to be an academically contentious issue that no one really wants to even go on a, a video as such and say, this is what you do. You just negate it in your design. Fine. I've seen many people, they say, well, I always put rests, mesial and distal, at least as a minimum. Fine. And then once we, this becomes a pivot point, you'll cut the rests off. So you can do that. Some people say, well, I always clasp it and then I don't have to clasp the three, which is in the aesthetic zone. Well, fine, but I'm clasping this three, so I might as well have two. No, you know, unless the patient has like a, a Bell's palsy where they're only, you know, uh, showing half their face when they're smiling. So this one here can be treated many ways, but because there's a lift and a load to the free end of the class two academically, I think it would be prudent just to leave this alone. If this is a tooth borne or tooth supported partial denture, then which we'll talk about in the subsequent designs of class three and four, then possibly we will put rests and clasps. If I was a gambling person, then I would know for sure I would put all money down that tooth four or five would be the next to be extracted and be lost very shortly. Therefore, I have the choice of doing the finishing line here or all the way back, which I think I'm gonna to tend to go all the way back here. Again, planning for the future extraction of number five. And then I got a free end saddle. Maybe I'll wrap this bar up in acrylic as well. I don't know at that point what I'll do, but at least it'll be a, a seamless addition. Here's my lingual bar. It's a free end. My fulcrum line, a line drawn through the two most distal rests perpendicular, medially bisected, we have indirect retention here. And here is the load line back here. This is good, we have a lift and a load on the free end. Again, this is academically speaking. Um, whether in the uh, clinically they wanna put clasps and rests, that's fine. The whole idea of this program is to give you the baseline partial denture design 101. And then when you deviate from partial denture 101, then you know the caveats from that deviation. The caveats here are the premature extraction of tooth four, five. Okay. So keep in mind when we're going through this, like, well, the most dangerous words in the partial denture or even in dentistry is, well, I always or never. There's always occasionally and sometimes. And they're all dependent on the same things. CO, CR, VDO, aesthetics, right? Which is the vanity factor of the patient, right? Uh, what about dollars and cents? This plays a role in the, in the treatment plan as well sometimes. Unfortunately, I should leave that one to the end. Uh, and also restorative. Do the abutments need resto work before? Or do we need rest preps? Can we achieve preps? Will the patient agree to preps? And then existing dentition or existing appliance. So look at these in this order. What's the bite? What's the shade? What's the vertical dimension? What's our existing restorative? What restorative can we do? What's the dollars and cents? And what's the existing prosthetics that the patient's wearing already? You group all these together, and then you're coming up with a treatment plan. This drawing alone is not a treatment plan. This is just an illustration of an ideal replacement of the missing teeth or partially dental estate. Once we include all these, then this design starts to change slightly. Maybe it changes into implants. Maybe it changes into extractions and uh, bridge work. Maybe it uh, extends into just a hygiene appointment to start. Okay, so I'm putting the cart way before the horse. All this has to happen. And then uh, we always hear, you know, uh, well, the dentist asked me to remake this case. 
And then everyone says, well, what value of that customer is to you? Should you do it or you shouldn't? And by me suggesting all these things to my doctor, that I'm going to reverse the situation is not what value are they to me, but what value am I to them? And is that valued? It's a two-way street, okay? But without our academic know-how, without our experience, without our economic viability in the marketplace, then therefore this is seriously affected. Now, before I get off a topic and we get off partial dentures on design and the, and the, uh, the soft sciences of, uh, of open market and business, let's move on to our Kennedy class two for our simplest second molar replacement. Now, if this molar doesn't have an opposing dentition, I'm not going to go back here and replace it. If we can restore occlusion, at least to the first molar, uh, with uh, opposing dentition, that would be fine. But let's just assume it's missing and we need to replace it. How am I going to adhere these teeth to the major connector? Step one, maybe I need metal backings. Maybe I have posts. Maybe there's no flange. Maybe it's ridge lap. Maybe it's mesh in posts. You decide. And usually it depends on vertical dimension, centric relation, centric occlusion, how these teeth and aesthetically, this is a difficult case. We've got our aesthetic four interior teeth here. You know, unlike the case above it, posterior functional case, now we've got an aesthetic problem here. Adjacent to the modifications must be closed from these two guide planes. Mizuku's arrest on the free end with the simplest clasp form possible. Opposing side is dentate, anterior is possible, posterior is possible. Really, if you follow these rules, the design starts to design itself, right? This designs itself. And I am just following the four rules of design. Now, whether the patient can tolerate all this huge uh, closed oval major connector. That's another story. So I decide to apron the canines. You can put singular and rest as a minimum, but I aproned it to come with a minor connector here attaching. This would be like a Kennedy bar on this. And this looks more symmetrical. Again, this is our fulcrum line, theoretically, and we've got a lot of indirect retention up here, and we have indirect retention in the form of the posterior palatal bar. Let's get into the last drawing. Try to get this in under 30 minutes, which I think is... Enough time. Outline the edentulous areas here. Direct retainers, step two, adjacent to the edentulous areas. We've got a roach clasp on number three. We've got, let's say, the J clasp because it's a lateral. So we're going to come to the mesial because it's usually, you know, more labially inclined. Something like that. Modified roach J clasp. But I think you have to clasp it. Awful to clasp the lateral, but no choice into doing so. Outline the edentulous area. Direct retainers are done. So step one and two, outline the edentulous areas, identify the direct retainers, clasp after surveying, aesthetics and all that considered. And then step three, auxiliary rest. Do I need any auxiliary rest? Well, I only got one left, 3.7 molar, maybe even a 3.8. If that goes, then I'm in a class one, and I would only have lateral and canine. There's only five teeth. So why don't we just plate them all for more indirect retention? So that's step three, auxiliary rest. If you chose not to, and this was, let's say, an examination, um, that would be fine if you didn't. But there you have it. So now by putting my auxiliary rest step three it fills in my step four major connector it designs itself with some options and again the more practice you have the more you're keeping these in mind so i leave you with kennedy class two and thoughts thereof uh, we've completed some of these castings in our program dent 1158 and dent 2004 and uh, hopefully you get a time to review these over and over and uh, practice amongst yourselves. Okay, thanks for your help. Attention.